Thank you. I'm David Warcanfield. It's a great pleasure to be here at World Saxophone Congress number 16. Uh, I've been at each one since 2003, and each one is more exciting than the last, so thank you for coming. Uh, it's my great privilege and pleasure to address you on the topic of my favorite piece of music and to present my new arrangement of it. So, I don't think I need to rehearse too much in the way of, of biographical or background information about Mussorgsky and his, one of his uh, greatest creations. Uh, uh, Modest Petrovich Mussorgsky uh, lived from 1839 until 1881, uh, living to the ripe old age of 42, reminding me of uh, American humorist Tom Lehrer's comment that it is a sobering thing to reflect on the fact that by the time Mussorgsky was my age, he had been dead for 20 years. <laughs> so, as an aside, I might mention that I've already lived too long to be a great composer, but if I die soon, I could be maybe considered a good one. In any case, uh, Mussorgsky was part of a group of Russian composers, nationalist composers, uh, known as the Mighty Five, or more accurately translated as the Mighty Handful, uh, composed in uh, Mili Balakirev, Cesar Kui. Uh, Alexander Borodin and then Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov. All these composers were associated with a circle of musicians, artists, poets, painters, uh, with Vladimir Stasov, uh, who was a, uh, a, a musical encourager, shall we say. And uh, Mussorgsky, as part of this group, uh, felt drawn more to the non musical portions of it than the, the ones who were musicians in it, because the musicians in it tended to look down upon his creative art, uh, thinking that he was rather unschooled, unskilled in uh, basic musical skills. Uh, and so he was drawn to, uh, especially to the painter and architect uh, uh, Hartman, Nikolai Hartman. I'm sorry, it's not Nikolai. It is, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Victor, I'm sorry. Victor Hartman uh, was born in 1844, and uh, Mussorgsky became acquainted with him in around 1869 through Stasov. And Hartman uh, died very suddenly in August of 1873 of an aneurysm. And this event sent Mussorgsky into a bit of despair. He began drinking even more than was his norm and uh, disappeared from his circle of friends for extended periods of time. It was only in the spring of 1874, February and March to be precise, uh, that when Stasso put on an exhibition of approximately 400 of Hartman's paintings and drawings uh, that Mussorgsky visited this exhibit and began to uh, be relieved from his depression. And we can be quite certain that it was this exhibition that motivated and inspired Mussorgsky for his pictures at an exhibition. We do not know exactly when Mussorgsky began work on this work. It was sometime in the spring of 1874. We do know that uh, he finished the fair copy of the piece during the month of June of that year, but there are no surviving sketches to give us any hints about his first thoughts on the piece. We do have his testimony from his, from his letter to Stossel that uh, he was making very good and quick progress on the work that he originally called Hartman. But uh, the work was not premiered or even performed anywhere uh, during Mussorgsky's lifetime as far as it's known. This is a little surprising considering that Mussorgsky himself, a very fine pianist, the best pianist of the five, went on tour in 1879 through Russia and as far as is known, did not perform the piece. Indeed, the premiere of the piano version, interestingly, was given right here in the UK. The first verifiable performance of the piano version was in the UK in 1914. Prior to that, though, we had an orchestration undertaken, probably at the suggestion of Rimsky Korsakov, who oversaw the publication of the piece in uh, 1886. And uh, it was done by a little-known student of Ripsy Korsakov's name, uh, Mikhail Tushmalov. Tushmalov did not orchestrate the entire work, but did the better part of it. And this version was done, conducted by Ripsy Korsakov in 1891. So Pictures was launched in 
other than its original garb. And I think composers and arrangers ever since then have taken that as a cue to freely arrange the work for any combination of instruments they would, would like to do. Uh, the, of course, the best known arrangement is that of Ravel that was undertaken on commission from Serge Kusevitsky in 1922. Uh, Kus Kusevitsky paid Ravel the princely sum of 10,000 francs and um, yielded a, a work that has re remained an enduring masterpiece in the orchestra literature ever since. And of course, incidentally, has given saxophonists their most famous orchestral soul uh, in the old Il Vecchio Costello movement. However, Pictures was quite slow to catch on in the musical public, in its, especially in its piano version. It was not until as late as 1942 that a studio recording was made, although there were piano rolls made as far back as 1910. But uh, Alexander Brailovsky made the first studio recording in 1942 for the Victor Company. And even as late as 1958, when Sviatoslav Richter performed the work in Sofia, Bulgaria, there were only 20, fewer than 20, commercial piano recordings. But the Richter performance, which was issued on Philips in, the, in Europe and, and on the Columbia label in the United States, electrified the musical world and propelled, in my opinion, propelled pictures and exhibition in its original form into the standard piano repertoire. It's now almost a, uh, a scene of well known for pianists to, to learn this piece. And indeed, this listing here uh, of all piano recordings known to me has more than 433 items on it. So it has been one of the most widely, if not the most widely recorded piano piece. Now, of course, arrangers have had lots and lots of tries at it, too. Um, there are, indeed, I'll go back to my notes here so I don't get hopelessly lost. More than 50 orchestra versions, more than 70 for concert band, more than 30 for organ, at least 16 for jazz ensembles of, of, of various sorts, a dozen for a rock band, and though I mentioned the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer version uh, precipitated an interest in classical music for countless thousands of, of young people. Um, and there are more than 30 versions for the various members of the saxophone family. And indeed, uh, I just picked up the latest Lombix uh, catalog and I found a few more that were unknown to me before then, so there's more than 30 now for the various saxophones. So what accounts for the popularity, the present popularity of this work? I would say there's a number of reasons for that. Very likely the, the idea of a piece based on friendship or memorial for one's dear friend is a big part of the draw of the piece. Uh, I've, uh, of course, friendship is one of the motivating you know, human inter interactions that we have. Uh, but I think it goes way beyond that. The tie-in with the world of art is another factor, certainly, but uh, I think we also have to assume that because there were many works of music tied in with art before pictures and after that, um, that's not the only explanation as well. I would suggest that pictures presents us with a panoply of various aspects of life itself. You have, for instance, youth in Tuileries, contrasted with death, in the catacombs. You have wealth in the Samuel Goldberg section of that movement versus poverty, poverty in the Schmidlo section. You have fantasy in Baba Yaga, uh, contrasted with everyday life in Limoges, which depicts a, a, a women gossiping in the Parisian marketplace. You have a beast of service in Bigwo, contrasting with um, creatures of mere potential, as in the ballet of unhashed chicks. And you have a picture of true emotion that exists in Il Vecchio Castello, the old castle, with a troubadour singing to his lady. Uh, that could contrast with a completely uh, grotesque distortion thereof in Nomos, which depicts a, a misshapen and rather ugly dwarf. So pictures then not only portrays Hartman's artwork for us, I think it gives us a good portrayal of Mussorgsky and Hartman themselves, but even more than that, 
I think pictures, in pictures we can see ourselves, every person that comes to this piece to perform it, or every person that comes to this piece to listen to it, can see something of him or herself in this work. Let me say just a few words about my own arrangement then. As an inveterate collector of every known arrangement of this masterpiece, um, having collected some, um, as I say, over 400 piano recordings and um, more than 500 different arrangements of the work and uh, more than 800 recordings of those 500 arrangements, you can imagine that as a composer, I would be drawn to doing my own arrangement someday. And I doubt that this will be my last arrangement. Uh, unless I indeed do die quickly and, and become a good composer by doing so. So, I thought of doing an arrangement for saxophone a long time ago as I became interested in the saxophone. And when I talked to Kenneth Che, who had an interest in the work as well, it was a natural that, uh, that I would go in the direction of, of writing something for him. The idea of doing it for four saxophones um, and piano was also rather natural in the sense that it's hard to conceive of a movement like Bidwo, which is a lumbering depiction of oxen pulling an ox cart, a very heavy ox cart. It would hardly be hard to imagine that on the soprano sax, just as it would be to imagine Baba Yaga uh, played uh, on the soprano sax, uh, or as it would be um, almost unfathomable to imagine the ballet of chicks and uh, unhatched chicks done on, on the baritone sax. So, uh, the trickiest thing was determining how much rest that the saxophonist would need in a, in a half an hour plus piece, um, how much time was needed to change from one sax to the other. Um, those sorts of things were the probably the most difficult thing about doing this arrangement. Now I do use the word arrangement advisedly because this is an arrangement and not merely a transcription. A transcription would just take the notes that Mussorgsky wrote and put them in another instrument. You will hear figurations, elaborations, all kinds of things in the sax part especially, but also in the piano part that are not in the historic the original. However, I did not want to make this piece anything that was not recognizably Mussorgsky. Uh, I wanted the effect to remain as Mussorgsky wrote it. So what you will hear is about 90% Mussorgsky and about 10% Canfield. And hopefully the 10% Canfield will not distort too much what Mussorgsky did. But it is uh, intended to, beyond that, it is intended to be a showpiece, a, a virtuoso display piece that will be fun to play for saxophones and undertake it, and I hope fun to listen to as well. Now, just a word about the artwork that you will be seeing projected behind you. Mussorgsky was inspired by Victor Hartmann. But, interestingly, many artists have been inspired to paint paintings based on Mussorgsky's music. I initially thought of doing a, uh, a conflation of of many of these different artists that have been inspired by Mussorgsky, but when time became short and I didn't have enough time to contact each of the artists involved, I decided to settle on just one artist, an artist from New Zealand named Phil Truston. Truston's art, you will see, has a lot of angularity in it, a lot of very bold, bold and vivid colors, which I think represents and complements Mussorgsky's music very, very well. It's a very primitivistic kind of, of art, and I think Mussorgsky's music is, is often exhibits that same primitivistic quality. So I hope that you will think that the art also matches the music that inspired it. Trust him is also the most prolific artist who has painted uh, works based on this particular piece. He has done uh, more than 140 of them to date, and you will see almost all of them in this, in this video um, during the course of the work. One other thing I should say in my arrangement is that it, by no means am I attempting to improve upon Morton Mussorgsky's masterpiece. One does not improve upon a mas masterpiece like this. What I was trying to do was to reimagine the piece 
for an instrumental combination that Mussorgsky did not have in mind. After all, Ravel and others have done the same thing. Uh, they, Mussorgsky did not conceive of this piece in terms of another instrument other than the piano. Uh, had he done so, I would like to think that what I've done for saxophone is something that he could conceivably have done in this, in this arrangement, in this version of it. All right, I think in the interest of time, I will just open up. Uh, if there are any questions from any of you that I can answer briefly, uh, otherwise we'll go to the, the piece itself. Anybody have a question? All right, well, thank you. And uh, I would like to thank, thank before I go, uh, Kenny Irons and his crew for their assistance in getting set up here. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Kenneth Chay and Dr. Alan Huckleby Allen Barry to give the premiere of pictures at an exhibition in this room.